Um, every good story starts with a once upon a time. And here's mine. I'm going to ask you guys to help me out a little bit in the beginning. So this is me. People joke sometimes that I call myself the production princess. This is on the set of Alice Through the Looking Glass, and I'm wearing the Queen's crown. I like to call Helen Bonham Carter my queen, so she thought it would be funny to put her crown on me and uh, take this picture. But it gives you an insight into my personality that I would be ridiculous enough to sit on set and wear her crown. So I have three amazing children. I'm a single mom to three incredible kids, and I'm going to ask you guys to help me. This is the interactive portion. So my oldest child is named... Yes, look at the slide. Robin Hood. No. John. Somebody back there? John. Hunter. My little child is named Dash. Dash. And my youngest, my little girl, this one's a little harder, is named. Anybody know where this is? Sawyer. Sawyer, yes, exactly. Those of you that have visited Disneyland. So I grew up in. Yes. And I spend as much time as possible at. Yes, where my favorite ride is Storybook Land, exactly. And the thing I love about Storybook Land, and I've loved it since I was a child, is it's the best combination of inspiration and imagination. When you ride on Storybook Land, which if you haven't been on, is an amazing ride You go through the whale through the whale's mouth, and there are miniature lands of all the different lands that you've come to know from the Disney stories over the years. And I love the riding the boat every time. You can kind of play the story in your mind or imagine what that would be. You know, I had decided very young that I wanted to make movies. That idea of visual storytelling was just so fascinating to me. I was so drawn in by that moment in the dark. You know, I would go to the movies and, you know, movies would make me laugh and make me cry and help me see the world or sometimes even myself in a new way and I had decided from a very young age that I wanted to make movies. So Disney, it was all started by a mouse. You know, Disney fans come in all different shapes and sizes. As I said, for me, it really started with the characters and the stories and going to the movies. I was looking at the slide and actually thinking that I could probably name every single one of these characters, which is kind of crazy. Maybe you guys could too, the ones of you that are here that are Disney fans. You know, my kids and I like to play that game, the A to Z game, where you have to name Disney characters with each letter. And I was so excited when we saw Zootopia, which is an awesome movie, but it also has a new Y character. You know, there's yaks now that you can use when you're playing the A to Z game. So, some Disney fans um, collect things, you know, here's a Mickey obsessed person and some, uh, you know, collect pins. I like to spend as much time as possible here at Disney World. I was thinking about it coming here this trip that I added it up and I spent 18 weeks of my life on a vacation here. So that's sort of like four or five months, um, which is awesome. I really love it here. I do have too many pins. This isn't a picture of me, but pins are a super fun thing to collect. Some people like plushies, again, you know, uh, inspired by the characters. Now, Disney fans also have their own kind of semi-secret language. I don't know if any of you know, like, what does this stand for? Out to the Caribbean. Okay, right, and there was like cutie Johnny Depp who's in our movie. Um, what about this one? Anybody? These are so easy for you. Okay, this one might be a little bit harder. The Arcans. The Arcans. The Arcans. Okay, you guys are too good at this, right? Everybody knows this. Be Our Guest, by the way, is a beautiful new restaurant here. I got to have lunch there yesterday, and I did try the great stuff, and it is delicious. Uh, if you haven't been, you should try it. Okay, what about this one? What? You guys got it in one second. A Disney Cruise Line fish extender. Okay, so for those of you that haven't been on the Disney Cruise, and I've been on seven, and not in a way that like the company like lets me go or pays me to go, like I pay myself to go with my kids because we love it so much. A Disney Cruise Line fish extender is a really interesting thing because it speaks to what's so special about the Walt Disney Company and the family of people that are friends and family of it. So if you're going on a Disney Cruise Line, you can go online at the Diz boards or any of the places I'm sure you guys are all familiar with. 
and a group of people will get together who are going to be on your cruise. I am positive this does not happen on the Royal Caribbean or Norwegian or any other ones. So you basically make a group of all your other Disney fans who are going on the cruise together and you create a little, it's like a thing that hangs on your door and you put treats in it and you all agree that you're going to bring something from your home city and your home state and share it with the other Disney fans who are on your cruise. So I've done this many times and there's always 50 or 100 people in the group and every day you'll get little surprises in your door from the other Disney people who are on your cruise of where they're from or something they've made or a little note from their family and it's a really really special thing one of the many reasons I love the cruise um, these are my kids so over the years um, we do the traditional things as Disney fans pose in front of the castle eat the junk food in the park pose for a photo pass picture these are some of them when they're super little. Um, this one I included just because, you know, when you're trying to take a picture of the fireworks with your phone and there's no way to get a good exposure and you keep trying different ones. And I love the fact that I actually took this picture on my phone of the castle and the fireworks turned out so great. But it also just speaks to me about what I love so much about the parks because it's a magical time to be there with your family. And again, for me, the parks are the movies come to life. The parks are where you get to meet the characters and live inside the stories and ride the rides where the stories become a part of your reality. So as you can tell, I am a Disney parks nut. Um, storytelling, as we're talking about, this is a plaque that's uh, in California Adventure, back where I live, where Walt is talking about storytelling. And you know, for me, on these two movies, telling the Alice story started, it's been 10 years now since we started the first movie. Um, it all began, my very good friend, Linda Wolverton, who's um, an incredibly accomplished screenwriter. She wrote Beauty and the Beast for Disney, and she worked on Mulan. She wrote the first Alice, and the second Alice, and Maleficent, and a lot of other great movies. Um, years ago, 20 years ago, I had bought the galleys of a book before it was published called Wicked, and Linda wrote a script for me of it for a live action movie that we never got to make, but we had become very good friends. So, 10 years ago, Linda came to me and said, I have a great idea for a movie, I want to do Alice in Wonderland. We'll do a female empowerment movie, it'll be about the girl, she'll get to be the heroine, she'll get to wear the army and the, the armor and pull the sword and slay the Jabberwocky, which all sounds super exciting. But again, it started out as a smaller idea. We developed the script, Disney wanted to make it, we were so happy. We sent it to our first choice director, Tim Burton, and he signed on. He had the great idea that we should have Johnny Depp play the Mad Hatter, and Tim had the good idea at the time that we should do it in 3D, which everybody wasn't doing at the time. So then our little female empowerment story grew into something much bigger as we developed the story. Um, this next one is a... Oh, well this is on the set of the second movie, as I'm talking about how much I love Alice. So the first movie came out in um, 2010 to great success. So much success, of course, that the studio said you should make a sequel. But none of us had really planned for a sequel. I mean, there are a series of books, and obviously Lewis Carroll has been popular for 150 years. Um, so there was lots and lots of material to pull from. I mean, as we dug into it, we realized we could make 10 Alice movies with different characters and different fascinating stories. The second movie, we decided to shoot um, all on location in London. The first movie, we had shot just the exteriors in London. Oh, this is a little... Wordle of Alice. I love these wordles. I'm sure you guys post them since you're big on social media, all the different things that Alice makes you think of. This was one of my favorite ones I saw on Instagram. I can relate to Alice in Wonderland. She just keeps randomly eating and drinking everything she sees with the hope it might magically solve all her problems. <laughs> this is me, for sure, right? Like, what problem can't be solved by eating or drinking something delicious? And then, of course, in the last day that I've been able to be here at Disney World, like, what about all the stuff to eat and drink here? I mean, I got to go to a bar at the Polynesian that I'd never been to before, where it's all um, retired jungle boat skippers, and they make these fantastic drinks. You have to try it if you have time, if you haven't been there. And the drink that you order creates a magical interaction in the bar. How cool is that? Like, if you order a volcano, there's this cool magical picture on the wall, and it erupts into a volcano. I mean, only at Disneyland, right? I mean, there's so many treats that we all love here. My favorite is a chocolate dipped Mickey gingerbread cookie that I went to Disney's Candy Company yesterday at Disney Springs to get, which is fantastic. Um, so I have a little uh, featurette I'm going to show you guys about why we wanted to make this movie and kind of the idea behind what we wanted the sequel to be. Um, this is online and um, I will post the link for it after the talk and yeah, you guys can post this if you want, so enjoy this little featurette. Alice has become a boss. She's following her dream. She's doing impossible. 
impossible things. And gone too long, Dennis. She's pretty fearless, and she's what we would call a modern woman. Alice, we need you. The Hatter is in great danger. Carol was the first person to put a girl, really, as this hero of a book. If I just need, I will help him. He was very keen to kind of convey the girls that he knew and their strengths. And I think Mia helps that character be the character that Lewis Carroll wants her to be. Lewis Carroll wrote this incredibly inquisitive, curious, smart girl who was not intimidated by anything. What are you waiting for? Let's go! Alice is a great character. She's very much her own person. Alice stands up for what she believes in and is going through her journey very much her own self. I think Linda Morgan has really done brilliantly at using all the iconic characters. I was quite excited to come back and play Alice. Sorry! I got to work with the most fun people I've ever worked with. And all of it in Wonderland. What more could you want? I know you guys are going to get to see the movie tomorrow, well in advance of the uh, May 27th release. We've literally only had one other audience watch the movie, so um, I'm so glad you guys are going to get to see it. Um, as I said, we shot the whole um, movie in London the second time. Um, as a working mom, I'm sure you can appreciate that the idea of going to work in London for six months um, was actually super exciting for my three children who got to go to school and be on set with me there. So there's always that part of working it out. Uh, we lived in Hampstead. This is a picture of my two younger ones on the hill overlooking London. And the top picture, you know, in the UK and in Hampstead where we live, they have they call them bathing ponds. This was fascinating to me because it's their version of a swimming pool, but it's really just a lake and like it's like you know, muddy on the bottom, and I think there were eels in it. I never went in it, but my children loved it. Adventures in London. Um, you know, in London, they have lots of pubs, and this is an idea I wish that we had in California. As you know, there's one here in Epcot. But you go with your kids, and you watch sports on TV, and there's some people drinking we didn't pay attention to, but they have delicious food. When we came home, my kids said they missed the pubs in London. This is a rare photo of the 17-year-old who will never allow his picture to be taken. And of course, I am not allowed to post or tag or mention or anything for fear of death, so you will rarely see a photo of him. This is in a pond in Hyde Park, so we did manage to have some fun. This is a beautiful Alice tea that they have at the Sanderson Hotel in London, and that's the director's daughter, James Bob, and that's his daughter, Maddie, with my daughter, having some Alice fun on location. Okay, Royal Ascot, because if you go to London, you have to go to Royal Ascot. Again, you can see how miserable the 17-year-old is. That I made him dress up, and that I took his picture, and now I'm showing it in public, so I'm in like double trouble. <laughs> Um, so in developing the film, we looked into the Lewis Carroll material, as I said, very deeply for the themes that we wanted to take on. And this is one quote, which you'll see is um, actually spoken in the movie by Alice's character and something that meant a lot to all of us. One of the secrets of life is that all that is really worth doing is what we do for others. Now, of course, all of you guys here today are moms, so you know the idea of doing things for other people and not doing them for yourselves, because that's what we do first. Um, but in the movie, you'll see it's a lesson that Alice doesn't necessarily understand at the beginning of the film, but in the course of her character arc in the movie, she takes to heart very, very deeply. And it's one of the two themes of the new film that really were most important to us. This idea of what we do for others is the most important. And also the preciousness of time. You know, we've added a new character that Sasha Baron Cohen plays, Time Himself. And it came from a reference in the book. There's actually a line in the Lewis Carroll book where the Mad Hatter is talking to Alice and he refers to time as a he. And he points out to Alice that time is not the thing as she understood it, but it's actually a real person as it is in our movie. Um, but, you know, Alice has a girl in her 20s and she has character goals and at the beginning of the movie she's set off on her grand adventure and she's not really in that place of necessarily thinking that time is limited, as many of us are in our 20s, right? You're trying to, like, figure out your career and get along with your parents and forge a new relationship or get married and have your own kids. And so that idea of how very, very precious our time is, our minutes, our seconds, our hours, that it's our most precious resource, and that it's very important to pay attention to how we spend our time and who we spend it with is the other big theme of the second movie. I'm super excited they brought some of the costumes here for you today, which is 
harder than you would think because the actual costumes from the movie are both so expensive and so difficult to produce. It's not like we could make 30 extras for Disney to use in promoting the movie. So the ones that are here today, for you to see, there are three of them, are the original costumes that the actors wore from the movie and literally one of only two sets that exists. Um, this piece you'll see on Sasha Baron Cohen's hand in the movie. You know, he's the character of time, so he has lots of watches and pocket watches. And off topic, but because we're girls and we like to shop, there's a beautiful home shopping network line of products, and there's a necklace that looks just like this that I'm hoping to buy when those go online on home shopping about a week before the movie comes out. <laughs> this is this toy that you see sometimes on someone's desk, but our lovely production designer, Dan Hanna, the Oscar-winning production designer, created it with all little hearts for the Red Queen's Chamber for the Queen of Hearts. This is a little book that you'll see Sasha uses in the movie to look up funny words. And when you see the town of Wits End in the movie, they all have these beautiful thatched roofs. And if you look very closely, each thatched roof has a thatched animal hidden somewhere on the roof. And then a little detail like this hanging from the front. This is the sweet shop uh, that you'll see in the movie. So when Alice is in the asylum, the beautiful, um, incredible, creepy place, uh, Andrew Scott, who some of you might know from the Sherlock Holmes show, he plays Moriarty, plays the doctor. And this is his box that he looks into of things that he might possibly shoot Alice up with. But again, in the movie, it'll fly by in one second and you'll never get to see it. And I love the beautiful detail. There's a scene in the Hatter's house where he sits at a desk and he's talking to Alice and he's writing letters. And this is the kind of detail, again, that you would never get to see. These are stamps with the Red Queen's face on them as if Underland uses a postal service run by that queen. Now, this slide, you'll get to see the detail. You can actually walk up and see this costume in person, but if you look closely, you'll see the A for Alice, the white rabbit, the Mad Hatter's hat, the red rose, Absalom the butterfly. This is an amazing fabric that Colleen Atwood made for Alice's Chinese costume, and like I said, you'll get to see it in person, which is super cool. Inside Alice's house, letters that Alice wrote to her mom from home, of course, our sampler from the first movie, and then just a little tidbit that the house in the movie that is where Alice's mother lives. In real life is where Benjamin Franklin lived. So Alice lives in Benjamin Franklin's old house. Um, during production, on the first movie we shot on green screen, it gave us all a terrible headache. It gave us purple glasses to wear, and the purple glasses did not help. On the second movie we shot on blue screen. As you'll see, there's lots of blue. And I, I included this one piece because you guys, obviously as social media experts, are probably interested. Um, this shot that you see of Alice, um, there of Mia, we shot what they call cinemagraphs, which now is um, something they use always to market movies, which is basically a moving poster. So I don't know if you guys have seen any of them. They're online, or if you're in London or any place that has outdoor billboards, as you go down the escalator in the tube, the characters will speak to you, will actually like reach out and say something to you as you're going by. Um, a new wave of social media marketing. Um, these are a bunch of the different sets. This middle one, when you watch the movie, you'll see there's a giant church and a crowning ceremony for the young queens. And you see that on the day we only had that one piece of stained glass and obviously everything else is on blue. This is the exterior of Alice's house. Uh, if you look at the ground, you can see how we covered up the actual street and the painted lines and the concrete and we made it look like it was 1875. This is also sort of a personal favorite. That church you see in the background is the church in real life where our director got married years ago, which is why he wanted to include that in the movie. As a little wink to his lovely wife. Um, I wanted you guys to see what we do sometimes on location to make things look more interesting for the movie. So you saw this slide before of the asylum, and then you can see the one next to it is what it looked like when we actually shot there. So Alice steals a carriage, I'm ruining this part for you now, and rushes out this doorway. And we thought it was more interesting to build these two statues so that you see. So we literally made those from scratch, put them up, fixed the stained glass above. That's what it looks like when you'll see it. And then they come down after production and it goes back to the normal way that it looks. Again, so much detail. So the end of the movie, I won't spoil you, I won't spoil where it is for you, but it's in a giant harbor in another place, in a distant land across the world. And when you see it in the movie, it looks amazing and fantastic and incredible. And you will be able to remember that this is what it actually looked like when we shot it. <laughs> the backyard at Shepperton with a bunch of big blue things. Um, you know, the movie takes so long to make, we end up celebrating everybody's birthday, anniversary. This is me is celebrating, that's her agent, Stephanie Ritz celebrating her birthday. Um, this is my daughter, who liked to work in many different jobs on the set. One day she decided she was going to be security, which is always trying to get paparazzi not to take pictures of the actors. So this is her very serious face, working with the security guy. 
with the high viz. Um, you won't be surprised to hear that her actual favorite job was bringing coconut water to Johnny Depp, because that's his favorite drink. <laughs> then she would tell everyone how she brought Johnny Depp his coconut water. This is lovely Richard Armitage, who plays the king, Helena's father, on location. Okay, so back to the working mom thing. Now this is the hard thing. Both of my little kids wanted to be in the movie, so I told them both they could be extras. This is my middle one, Dash, who you'll see in the opening scene in the movie. This is my little girl who shot a scene in the movie which got cut out. So if you really ever want to make your kids mad at you and disappoint them, yeah, that's the way to do it. So she has this picture, and that's about it for her memory of being in Alice. Um, this is back to the glamour of movie making. I happened across this one day, our lovely director James Bowman having his favorite fish and chips lunch next to the garbage, because there was no place else to sit. It was a day when we had a lot of extras and all the chairs were taken. But I see these things happening on the day, and I took the picture because I always think, nobody would believe that that's how we actually make these movies. We had a flood one day, and this is how you had to get to work, and we did have people who actually fell off the board and into the water. Uh, we get the girls back and forth to set. This was a rainy day um, in a golf cart. Again, so glamorous, right? This is exactly how you pictured it. These pictures you rarely get to see, and I wanted to include it because obviously Helena's head is normal size. So usually if you saw the three of these, she would have her big red queen head. Uh, but that's those guys working hard. Um, my assistant, who no one is more in love with Johnny Depp with her, so there's that when you're working. These are the two heads of Disney, Alan Horn and Alan Bergman, visiting us, and our uh, production executive from Disney. You can see a little bit of Wits End, this beautiful town that we built. You know, in the second movie, we actually built big sets. Which we didn't on the first movie. On the first movie, everything was green. So you can see in this, you'll see this scene tomorrow. Uh, this is inside Time's private chamber, and you see on the back of Sasha's head that blue piece. Obviously, in the movie, that's uh, replaced with incredible moving clockworks. It's all computer generated. And that girl you see standing there, of course, in the blue, is replaced by an incredible vegetable character called Nobody. And Helena's head would be big when you see this, and the director won't be standing in the shot. Um, so the opening scene, like I said, is Alice returning on her ship. This is the way we make that happen. You can't really tell from the picture, like, the enormity of this ship is up on a gimbal. So we build this ship, we put it on a gimbal so you can rock it back and forth, and then those giant towers make rain. This was in November, so poor Mia was freezing, soaking wet, blue lips acting the scene. But the funny thing I wanted to show you in the slides is there's the director up on the set covered head to toe in plastic because he's out in the rain. And there's me hiding in a van away from the rain. And then you can see the monitors that they've rigged inside the van so I could watch the scene and uh, talk to them from them hiding from the rain. The rain is really bad for my hair. Um, <laughs> um, the first group that saw it last weekend, we had a tea party. Um, with mostly just my friends in LA and Anne Hathaway and a couple other people from the movie. And it was great to have a group of women seeing it together because, you know, they laughed and they cried and we had these incredible conversations afterwards just about, again, how precious time is and how much our loved ones mean to us. And it's a very special movie. Um, Do the Looking Glass is also a wild ride. I don't know that people expect that about it because it's different from the first film in that way. Again, there's over 2,200 visual effects. There's big action adventure. And, you know, the idea that I get to make a movie that really is a female empowerment piece and, you know, you will watch this or with your mothers or your daughters or your sons as well and, you know, hopefully be proud of Alice and uh, what she accomplishes in the movie. Um, I have a little um, introduction I'm going to play for you from a special guest who is also a huge proponent of uh, female empowerment, and she's joined us on this journey for Through the Looking Glass, so we have one last little piece. <coughs> hey all you moms out there, welcome to the social media mom celebration at Walt Disney World. I'm Pink and I'm excited for you to all see Alice Through the Looking Glass, which I wrote an original song for, called Just Like Fire. I hope you enjoy it and go moms! <laughs> um, Pink saw the movie and loved what it had to say. She has a daughter and came on board with us. And I can't think of anybody better to work with us on this movie because all of Pink's music and this beautiful song that she's created for us, I don't know if you guys have heard it's climbing the charts everywhere. It's been really well received called Just Like Fire. It really speaks to our message of what we're trying to say with Alice and encouraging everyone to be their own unique selves and encouraging especially girls 
to use their voice and stand in their integrity and be who they were meant to be. So when you see the pink video, the fascinating thing is the director of the video actually decided to go very on point with the story of Through the Looking Glass, which is a book about eight kind of nonsensical chapters about a chess game. And you will see a chess game like nothing you have ever seen where pink plays every character on the board with amazing costumes by our own Colleen Atwood. So um, that's going to be online, I think, in three days. And um, I hope you'll really like that as well. I hope you guys love the movie. I'm passionate about this film, as I said, and the message it delivers to girls and young women. Alice, our strong, courageous heroine who will stop at nothing to protect the people that she cares about. I hope you guys enjoy it. I hope that you choose to share about it. We will be watching your posts and your blogs and your tweets and retweeting um, as we can. Um, you know, last week, I don't tweet very much, but the Walt Disney Twitter picked up one of my tweets from the Tea Party and tweeted it out to three million people and my Twitter like blew up. Like I couldn't imagine, obviously, that's like the beauty and power of, um, of Twitter. But thank you guys so much. I hope you enjoy the movie and enjoy your time here at Walt Disney World. Remember to subscribe.